Did Jesus rise from the dead and thus authenticate his claim to being the Son of God? Or is this a stuff of legend and mythology? For Christians, everything hinges on the resurrection. And today we're going to debate whether there's sufficient evidence to back it up. Joining me is Tim Callahan, religion editor of Skeptic Magazine and author of Secret Origins of the Bible. And Dr. Gary Habermas, who's considered one of the world's leading authorities on the resurrection, he chairs the philosophy and theology department at Liberty University, has written several books on the resurrection, his most recent being The Case for the Resurrection of Jesus. Well, Tim, let me start with you. Uh, in your book, you suggest that the resurrection of Jesus isn't original at all, but it's merely a story that was recycled from earlier mythology and mystery religions. You specifically in your book mention the stories of Osiris, uh, Adonis, and Addis. Uh, could you explain what all this means? Well, the resurrection uh, is, again, there were death and resurrection stories uh, uh, going all the way back, as you said, to uh, Isis and Osiris, and uh, usually in Dionysus, in, uh, in, out of the Greek mythology, became uh, he had his own separate cult. And uh, in all of these, they die an excruciating death of some sort. Uh, Dionysus is torn to pieces and eaten by the uh, Titans. Uh, and then they uh, arise physically from the dead. So you're saying that uh, this Jesus story then is just a recapitulation of this earlier mythology? Well, not necessarily exactly a recapitulation, but I, I think that uh, basically uh, the evidence for it is lacking. Okay. Uh, Dr. Habermas, what's your response to that? Let's take Adonis. Adonis is probably the ancient god for which we have the clearest data that he was raised from the dead. We have four accounts that Adonis was raised. The earliest one is the second century AD. The other ones are between the second and fourth century AD. The earliest account we have for Addis is the third century AD. And while Isis and Osiris as a religion was definitely pre-Christian, there is no resurrection in Isis and Osiris. Uh, Osiris in particular is not raised. Okay, Tim, how do you respond to that? I would point out that uh, oftentimes uh, the only copies of the myths we have are quite late as far as writings go, but quite often we have uh, some evidence of the myths in the form of uh, pictures on vases of the, of the various mythic uh, characters in the situations of the myths, so we can be pretty sure that they were being told orally a lot earlier. Go ahead, Dr. Abrams. If we're talking about stories on vases or in other reliefs, there is still no resurrection. There are no resurrected gods for which we have influence, for, for which we have data prior to the second century. Is like this I a, said, an objection, um, Gary, that you get a lot from scholars, that this is uh, the origin of the resurrection of Jesus is somehow uh, based on or influenced by these earlier mythologies? Well, I've done a count recently of uh, 1,200 sources on the resurrection, everything published since 1975 in German, French, and English. And I went back and I looked, how many of these scholars who hold university chairs, for example, how many of them who are not Christians, who do not hold to the resurrection, how many of them would say that in any way the mystery gods are, are a potential inspiration for Christianity? And I can count the number of skeptics on one hand. I can count them on one hand out of 12 hundred scholars. It's a real minority uh, view. Not entirely. I would still say that, uh, that, that, the, uh, that it was a common idea of a dying and rising God was around before Jesus. Well, that's not what Dr. Hebner said. We, we, would, yeah. we would have to agree to disagree on but that. One, one well, of yeah, you isn't the, right. The point is, Tim, if you're gonna, if you're gonna hold to a dying and rising God before, before Jesus, I want to say, where's the evidence? Well, I would say that, first of all, that the myth of Dionysus probably does uh, antedate Jesus. And yes, well, there isn't specifically resurrection, uh, specifically, I'm seeing crucifixion, uh, but I don't see that that's really uh, that important a point. Uh, the, they all undergo a, a horrible, excruciating death. You're going to have to give me a, a, a date for the earliest inscription because Dionysus, I don't know anybody who thinks Dionysus is pre-Christian, not the resurrection portion. Okay, well, uh, all I can tell you is that the myth is that he uh, is torn apart by the Titans, uh, eaten, and he is uh, raised from the dead. Uh, what is, is the a, date? I don't, know is the the, date I don't know the date of the, as I said, of the original um, uh, as far as any writings we have, but I know that the, with, with the myths, that the Greek myths, most of our Greek myths 
uh, we do have from later collections, except we know they are from they were told earlier because we have the vase paintings depicting them going way back in time. But the point, the question is, is there a resurrection? And since we don't have any resurrection predating the second century all the way to the fourth century, are the earliest ones, second to fourth, we can say, well, maybe there's a resurrection there, but there's no data. There's absolutely no evidence for that position. Uh, Gary, what do you see as being the affirmative case for the resurrection? Well, uh, Lee, let, let me state it this way. I do not assume that the Bible's inspired or even that the Bible is reliable as a text. I think we can get to those conclusions. But I like to take the data that critical scholars allow, even non-Christian critical scholars allow, and just say, look, I think we've got a good start in a case for the resurrection. Well, virtually all skeptics, makes no difference if you're a believer or an unbeliever, they put 1 Corinthians, a book that Tim accepts and says is reliable, they put Paul's creed, this, this early statement that Tim summarizes on page 427, Paul says, I gave you, listeners from Corinth, I gave you the text, the story of the gospel, which I received. Now, he's writing this in 55 A.D. And the, the crucifixion was when? The crucifixion, give or take a year or two, was about 30 A.D. That's a nice round year. Critics are willing to say that Paul probably got this material about 35 A.D., but Peter and John and James had it before Paul did. And so we're right on top of the events. Gerald of Collins, a moderate uh, Roman Catholic scholar, says that this material goes back to 30 A.D. And from this, we get a very early account, 30 -ish, right on top of the events. We get eyewitnesses. Paul at least is an eyewitness. Then we get Paul, the eyewitness, telling us that James, Peter, and John agree. And then thirdly, we have what I might call, if I want to keep up with the ease here, enthusiasm. They were, their lives are transformed by their belief that they saw the risen Jesus. People get transformed for a lot of things, but these guys claim they saw the risen Jesus. And fourthly, a fourth E, I believe that Paul implies an empty tomb in 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and following. So we have early eyewitnesses who are enthusiastic and willing to die for their message that Jesus appeared to them with an empty tomb. Okay. Tim, there is a minimalistic case, but a case being made for okay. the resurrection. How do you respond? Well, uh, you've mentioned the life-transforming aspect. Uh, there are people who've had their lives transformed by converting to Islam. I don't think Dr. Habermas would uh, say that, that proves that, that uh, Islam is divinely inspired. I totally agree with him that anything can cause a life change, usually a religious or political uh, commitment, but anything can cause a transformation. That wasn't my point. My point was that the disciples just weren't changed. They were changed because they believed they saw the risen Jesus. Now, transformations cannot prove what somebody's saying, but transformation can prove that somebody believes what they're teaching. And if we have the earliest apostles teaching that they saw the risen Jesus, we can say they're wrong, but we have their sincere belief that they believe in the risen Jesus, so sincere they're willing to die. I think that's very valuable. When a Muslim uh, dies because he believes in Islam, that's his belief centuries later that Islam is true. But th if you go back to the original disciples, they died because they believed they saw the risen uh, Jesus. To start out with Mark's uh, uh, resurrection appearances. Well, there, aren't, there aren't any, basically. The women, Mary Magdalene, uh, Mary the mother of James and Salome go to the tomb, they find an empty uh, young man in white sitting inside, presumably an angel, says Jesus is risen and he'll meet the apostles in, in Galilee and go tell them the women are terrified and they don't tell anybody. And that's the end of the uh, account. There's a supposition here that I want to mention. That almost the, the idea is that the Gospel of Mark is the earliest, and since there are no appearances, we're in trouble. If that's, it, Tim's not necessarily saying that, but others have said that. First of all, I want to say Mark does have an appearance, maybe more. He says, go tell the disciples and Peter. Some scholars think that that's an intimation of the appearance to Peter earlier, but be that as it may, Mark specifically says he's been raised, but the additional point I'd like to make here, and then I'll see what he says, is, is his point that uh, uh, Paul predates Mark by 15 or 20 years, and Paul has the longest list of appearances. Except that uh, Paul just basically gives kind of a summary. He doesn't give a uh, 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 blow-by-blow uh, appearances. Uh, first of all, Tim, if 
Paul has a summary here, as you just said. You said all we have is a summary in Paul. I want to know what's wrong with the summary. He gives a long list of appearances. If he gives more appearances than any other disciple, I want to know what's wrong with the good list from right on top of the events. If he received this material in 35 A.D., if two of the yeah, disciples... If two of the disciples, well, I'm using the dating of the critics. I'll give you a list of them, but these are people who are atheists and people who do not agree with evangelicals, and they put it in the 30s uh, A.D. So if Paul only, quote, has a summary, I'll take that summary, because we can make a case based on that summary alone. It's excellent evidence. You know, we're running a bit out of time here, so, Tim, okay. you know, summarize. Um, Sorry, you know, if you were to make a closing statement in, okay. in 30 seconds to a jury, okay. well, what would well, you basically, say? Well, uh, basically, the statement is that his appearance to the apostles uh, is, uh, Dr. Hibbman says there's one in uh, Jerusalem in Matthew, and I say the only one that uh, in Matthew where he appears is to the women, and he appears to the apostles on a mountaintop. And uh, if he, there were other appearances, you would think that a book purporting to argue for the divinity of Jesus would uh, put all of them in and not leave some out. Okay, yeah, Gary, a little bit of a closing statement from you. Sure. If Paul's the earliest and Paul's the best and we can build a resurrection case on Paul alone, we've got it. Okay. If we can base the resurrection alone on Paul, we don't even need to talk about the Gospels. If Paul can do it, we've got the data. Okay. And I think he does. All right, gentlemen, uh, interesting exchange.